My name is Martin Wolf. I write for the Financial Times. I'm the moderator of this session. Uh, I have moderated a great many sessions on the economic outlook for the forum um, in Davos and also once here two years ago, which I've never forgotten because it was right at the beginning of the crisis. Uh, one of the participants, if I remember correctly, was Bill Rose, Rhodes. Uh, um, and we were very concerned about what was going to happen, um, both of us and others on the panel. And looking back on it, we clearly weren't concerned enough. So the question for this panel, I'll come to this in a moment, is whether we should now be confident that the crisis is now over and uh, that we're looking to sunlit uplands. Uh, the, uh, we have a very distinguished panel. Um, uh, unfortunately, the acting governor of Bank Indonesia couldn't be present, but uh, let me just introduce the panelists to those who don't know them. Very briefly, to my left here is uh, Zhu Min, who's Group Executive Vice President of the Bank of China, one of China's most articulate economists. Uh, next to him is Heizo Takanaka, of course, a very distinguished Japanese economist and policymaker um, who played a huge role, decisive role, in restructuring the Japanese financial system under Prime Minister Koizumi. Uh, next to him is Stephen Roach, um, who is uh, uh, chairman of Morgan Stanley in Asia, uh, just released a book of his writings and one I think one of the most perceptive and brave and honest observers of the madness of the last 10 years. Uh, next to him and before that probably, before that uh, is uh, uh, next to him is Anthony Leung who is senior, senior managing director and chairman of Greater China for the Blackstone Group. Uh, and next to him, far my far left, is His, His Excellency Sheikh Mohammed bin Essa Al Khalifa, Chief Executive of the Bahrain Economic Development Board. Just to introduce the topic very briefly, um, everybody knows that about a year into what was already a crisis with accumulating problems, uh, um, the decision was made uh, it's still controversial whether it could have been avoided to let Lehman fail. This triggered uh, a major crisis in AIG and then essentially a seizure of the world's financial markets. In October of last year, an extraordinary and really unprecedented commitment was made by the G7 finance ministers to uh, essentially ensure the survival of, I quote, all systemically significant financial institutions, end of quote. And that is indeed what has happened with a completely unprecedented rescue program, uh, which was accompanied by equally unprecedented monetary and fiscal stimulus. There's never before, I think it's very important to understand this, there has never before in peacetime been policy action of the type we've seen in the last year. And I think if you look at the financial market indicators, all the indications are that this has been successful. The financial in markets, credit markets in particular, have largely recovered. In addition, we've seen, of course, the remarkable success of the China stimulus program, and India has also been doing quite well. And so people are getting very optimistic about economic recovery as well, particularly in this region. And what I want this, this uh, panel to do is to focus on the next year, thinking about whether we are at the beginning now of a very strong, vigorous, ro robust upswing, or whether there are si still significant problems left over from the massive credit explosion we saw in the 2000s, the extraordinarily low savings rates in the US and a number of other countries, the weakness in asset markets, particularly housing, and of course the weakness of the financial system. Have all these problems been resolved or not? And if they've not been resolved, does it matter for Asia? So those are, I think, the questions. Uh, I'm gonna start, if I may, with, uh, with Zhu Min. Since we are in China and everybody's fascinated by China's great success, I have to say, you told me very, in Davos, uh, we, it was on the FT video, uh, that China would indeed achieve 8% growth this year. 
and I was rather skeptical and I was utterly wrong. So describe the success and what is China going to do over the next year? Uh, how is this going to look going forward in this country? Xu Min. Well, thank you, Martin. And uh, first, uh, particularly thank you uh, to define me as an economist, not a banker. And in those days, uh, it's much better to be an economist than uh, be a banker, right? <laughs> and uh, that's nice. And uh, Not much better, it has to be said. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, you failed the forecasting Chinese economy have 8% of the GDP growth was, but I did, so, and so I'm okay. <laughs> um, yes, I think the Chinese economy runs very well, and uh, as uh, Premier Wen Jiabao said yesterday, um, but if you're looking for whole things, yes, the trade dropped 25%, but good news is it's st stabilized, and the consumption growth is very strong, 16 to 18% in the first six months, Obviously, the whole growth is supported by the infrastructure investments. Now, the concerns about whether that's a build on the overcapacity or rather is sustainable. But I would say uh, the good news is uh, all the money goes to infrastructure, so that will support uh, your question for the next year's GDP growth rates and also will support China goes into the next phase. I think this is very, very important. If you recall, in 1998, when we were facing Asia financial crisis, China took another stimulus package 10 years ago. At that time, we built a lot of roads. But at that time, you see the half of road empty. A lot of criticize of all the comments on whether China needs those roads. But if you see today, all the roads are packed already. What happens after, after this stimulus package, particularly on infrastructure investments? In the three to five years, you will see China will have modernized all the railway, railways. For example, China is building 13,000 kilometer high-speed railways, speed from 250 kilometer per hour to 380 uh, uh, kilometer per hour. China will build a bunch of uh, dozens of nuclear power stations, build more clean energy, and China will have a more urban utility service uh, and uh, the water sanitation systems it will bring the whole urban li uh, living standard up to another level. So I would say this is to create a really good environment for, for the future. And also current infrastructure investments will be able to support next year's growth. If you question for next year, I would say we probably will have another reasonable strong growth for next year. Now that doesn't mean we don't have a risk. The current risk, I think, is a, a, a few things. If you're looking for the short term, the short-term risk is the real sector have to pick it up yet. If you're looking for the industry output, the growth is still relatively weak, roughly 7%, but net profit from industry is still on the downside, dropped roughly 30%. But meanwhile, in the assets market, we see the formation of the bubble. So that would be very difficult in your situation. We see deflationary situation in the real sector, but we see the inflationary situation in the assets market, stock market commodity market and the real estate. This is a new situation for China and also for the world. I think this is a particular one, the short term issues. But the mid, middle term issues for China to, to tackle is really, what I thought is when the global uh, unbalancing readjusting, we see on the US and UK side has a deleveraging process. But we see in the China, in Germany, Japan and South Korea, in the decapacity process. How do we do the decapacity in line with the deleveraging? I think this is really a big challenge for us. Everybody understands that China have a more steel capacity, say, for example, 690 million tons. But the real demand for China this year probably 540 million tons. So it's a 150 million ton over capacities. This is, this is not only still more or less in the many, many other sectors. So how do we go through the decapacity process, restructure China's industry, and bring them to up value chain to meet its new world? I think this is the middle term challenge for China. But further, if I go for another words for long term, I firmly believe this financial crisis changed the whole world. We'll enter into a new world. We'll not be go back to go back to previous world. This is not a cynical, this is a slight different with Steve Roach and a few others. But what is the new world is not all clear defined yet. So China needs a clear strategy, think about 
what in the 10 years horizons China will be in this global economy families? What is whether China continue to be the manufacturing and uh, export industry or, or try to change it to more domestic consumption driven, which is ideal model, but obviously not easy to do. And, uh, and plus, in particular, low carbon uh, uh, environments, so what the role China should play. I think that's a long term issue for we, us to think. But we should be able to have a very reasonable, strong growth for next year. Thank you. Okay, so you've raised a lot of very important issues, and I'd certainly want to come back to this question of is, is this a new world and the role that China will play in it. I thought uh, I was going to ask later about excess capacity, and I think your figures for steel, which is essentially excess capacity greater than the total production capacity of Japan, um, is a sort of indication of some of the issues. I wouldn't much like to be a steel producer anywhere else in that sort of world unless I'm a very sophisticated one indeed. May I turn to you, Your Excellency uh, Sheikh Mohammed, to uh, discuss how you see the Gulf, the oil economy, uh, the prospects from your part of the world? Uh, well, the Gulf, I mean, we have to realize, is, is, a, is approaching a trillion dollars. The economy is almost the size of, of India in terms of GDP, much less popula population, of course, much smaller. And I think with all the efforts over the past 10 years, most of us in the Gulf are trying to use the oil to actually create value and diversify and not uh, just sit around and do nothing. Um, with that, we can play a bigger role in helping economic growth play a bigger role in, in, in global uh, affairs. And, uh, you know, of course, we have Saudi Arabia part of the G20 and um, all the investments in, in the sovereign wealth funds in Europe. I mean, the latest, I think, was Qatar and Volkswagen. Uh, we have all the other deals that have gone on. I think we will continue to see this trend in the, uh, from the Gulf being more integrated and trying to help uh, in our own little way global investment uh, in that regard. Um, and, and there is a fine line in this regard that we feel very, uh, what is it, protective. I mean, we don't like people to view the Gulf as a piggy bank to help solve uh, the world's uh, problems. This is not a charity. We will help create value. And, you know, when Gordon Brown last year came around the Gulf uh, looking for support, he didn't get much. And I think th the idea is we w are, are becoming responsible global citizens and will try to, to, to keep growing. There are opportunities. It is a growing market within the Gulf. Uh, but at the same time, we realize that in order for us to grow, we have to help everyone else grow. So it is creating win-win situations and reinvesting um, any oil wealth to create value both domestically within the GCC and uh, across the world. So uh, I think th the short answer to your question is we can, we're willing to help play a productive role in helping global growth given the assets we want, but we're also focused on, on diversifying our economies um, to reduce the dependency on, on a single source of revenue, uh, but are more than willing to, uh, to partner up around the world. Just let me, uh, one follow-up question. As you said, uh, the Gulf is the home to huge sovereign wealth funds. Do you see a huge switch in the focus of investment towards the Asian region, uh, away uh, from the, the sort of traditional homes? Is this part of the consequence of what Humin calls the new world? Uh, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I, I come from uh, government organizations and my counterparts across the Gulf. Um, we all feel the future of global growth is between Japan and the Gulf. And, and China's the heart and India's is, is uh, another important player. And uh, absolutely is, is, is the answer. You know, what people don't realize is the importance, oil will continue, I believe, continue to play an important role. The Gulf has 40% of proven reserves, but only 20% of production. So as we go forward, the importance of the Gulf in helping stabilize prices uh, will continue to grow. And, and I think, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia here plays a very important role and, and uh, will continue uh, 
uh, to push this. So yes, the future is is in Asia. And you know, we talk about the Gulf, but I always try to remind people that we are actually in Asia. You know, the Middle East is not treated as part of Asia, but we are Western Asia, and don't forget us, please. Very good reminder. Um, I recently at a, a dinner here remarked that I, I regard Asia as a fictitious continent, as Europe is. There is, there are, these are not genuine continents. So I actually think there's one continent, Eurasia, which is of course the one that matters most. But we, that's another subject. Uh, we'll leave that. Anthony, how is your perspective as a private investor uh, in the region? Um, is the uh, is the crisis all over? Are we in a new massive sustained upswing? And how does it look as an investor? Well, the last year when I uh, was attending the same forum in Tianjin, I said that um, after financial crisis, the next two or three years would be the best time to invest. And we are now kind of one year after the major crisis, uh, so it's still within the two to three year period. But as uh, Zumin just have, has just said uh, not too long ago, we are seeing different sets of uh, circumstances between the West uh, and the East. Um, I won't use the word decoupling, but they are certainly very different. Uh, the growth trends are very different. Uh, the leverage ratios uh, are also very different. So as, as a private equity firm, uh, we may want to kind of see these strategies as two, as two different sets of strategies. Uh, in the West, uh, we probably would focus on uh, rescue financing, uh, distressed debt financing. Uh, we may be focusing on cyclical rebounds, and that's why a uh, financial institution would be very interesting. Uh, Mid-sized buyouts uh, would be uh, very interesting. I don't think the large buyouts would be as easily financed as before. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, in Asia, where we focus a lot of attention, because everybody, uh, as the Excellency has said, um, this is the area of growth. And here we, we really focus on the fundamentals. Uh, is the growth that matters. It's not so much uh, picking um, the bottom or having the leverage. And in particular, in China, we will focus on the fundamentals that drive growth, including uh, the continued industrial upgrade, including the growing middle class, including uh, fast urbanization, uh, and on the other hand, is also a fast aging population. Um, and also the increasing globalization of the Chinese economy. All of these would spell uh, tons of opportunity for private investors. Maybe I'll just stop here and... Uh... So this is very consistent with the view of a fundamentally bifurcated world. Uh, in the West, it's just about rescues and sh um, short-term uh, uh, opportunities created by market collapses, while in Asia, particularly in this region, something completely different is going on. Um, may I turn to you, Heizo Takanaka, uh, first to talk about Japan, um, remarkable political developments recently, and of course, a very deep recession, incredibly deep recession, uh, I think the most severe um, in GDP terms of the G7. And then perhaps just comment briefly on how you see from the lessons of the Japanese experience us coming out of this financial crisis, whether the right things are being done now to avoid um, in the developed countries, particularly the US, UK, repeats of the same difficulties Japan had in the 1990s. Well, thank you, Martin, for this opportunity. Uh, September every year, this summer Davos is held. And every year, I have been reporting new prime minister uh, took office in Japan. <laughs> and this time also, we're going to have a new prime minister next week. <laughs> but this time it's a little bit different from our ruling party itself will change. Uh, I do not uh, talk uh, details of this change. Uh, if you're interested, please join the two o'clock session focusing on Japan. But anyway, uh, we now see so-called double shape recovery process. Uh, last fall, we had serious uh, so-called confidence crisis and GDP dropped very sharply, but it uh, hit the bottom already. And in the very short term, we Asian countries see a very rapid growth. In the case of China, uh, this is of course estimate in the second quarter, amazingly 14.9% growth, and Korea 11% growth. Even in the case of Japan, 
positive 4% growth, though United States growth rate in the second quarter was minus 1%. So in the short run, we see a very sharp recovery. But this is, we'd like, I'd like to say, this is v shape in the process of v shape recovery. Uh, the reason is uh, this is not sustainable. The, uh, uh, the, the background of this recovery, we have two factors. One is China. China is playing a very important role. At this moment, China's GDP is almost equal to that of Japan's GD, Japan, uh, Japan's GDP. And next year, uh, China's GDP will exceed that of Japan. A Chinese role is very important. A second factor for this recovery is very rapid expansion of fiscal expenditures in these countries. Uh, China do that, and Japan, Korea, uh, and all in the United States, of course, doing uh, that kind of policy. But this is not sustainable. In the case of China, national bond GDP ratio is still very low, around 20%, 30% level, that you can continue that. But in all industrialized countries, it is impossible to continue this kind of very rapid fiscal expansion. Uh, so sooner or later, we will see some uh, chance of decline again. And another important factor is uh, we still have very strong uncertainty in U.S. financial market. Uh, Secretary Gaetana is doing the right thing. The direction of the policy is correct. But estimated uh, capital shortage is uh, much smaller than uh, the, what we expected. So I am personally uh, predict the second round of Gaetana plan is necessary sooner or later. And finally, I'd like to mention one important point based upon Japanese experience. Yes, the government is increasing the government expenditures. It is correct in the short run. But there are two kinds of policies. That is, one is policy to help. Another one is policy to solve. In the case of Asian countries, uh, yes, uh, as uh, was mentioned by Dr. Zuming, infrastructure investment uh, is good in the short run, also in the long run. Uh, however, just to rescue the damaged people, damaged companies. This kind of policy is also taken by some countries. This policy to help will require another round of policy to help. Uh, so then the, the solution will not come. This is actually we experienced in the 1990s. So how to get rid of this policy to help and shift to, to policy to solve? This is the most important factor to be watched. Uh, so uh, otherwise, we'll see very long or uh, lost decade or lost two decades, just like Japan we experienced in the 90s. Thank you. Let me just make sure that I understand that you made, raised many very important issues. You talked about a second Geithner plan, if I understood you. Could you describe very, very briefly what you think the components of such a plan would have to be? Okay. Well, under such circumstances of confidence crisis, Government activism is needed. And a symbol of government activism is the capital injection from the government. This is correct. However, before this capital injection, accurate assessment of asset is needed. Is this correctly done or not? Actually, we experienced one uh, huge amount of capital injection. But at that time, in the 1999, but at that time, the assessment of capital was not enough. So another round of capital injection became needed. So this cap as accurate assessment of capital is being done or not. This is the most crucial point. So the implication, we'll come to this later, is that the stress test exercise was more public relations than reality. We'll come to this, uh, uh, I'm putting it in a, in a sharp way, we'll come to that because it's quite important. Uh, Steve, um, so what's wrong with what's been said so far? Uh, and in particular, in particular, in the Western world, have we been providing help but not a solution? Thank you, Martin, and, and thank you for um, prejudging my comments. <laughs> I'm, I'm tempted to be um, take based the other on, side of that, but I based won't. Based on the extensive experience. Yeah. Um, fair point. Uh, eight months ago in Davos, we met in the eye of the storm. And the, uh, the hurricane-like winds that were blowing them uh, then have subsided. Uh, and so the, the worst of the precipitous downturn in the global economy, hopefully, is behind us. And so the comparisons, by definition, uh, automatically start to look better. Uh, but you pose the most important question of all, Martin, and that's the question of 
sustainability. We have to be very careful in making the st distinction uh, between, um, to use uh, mathematical jargon, uh, second and first derivatives. Uh, the fact that the rate of decline has moderated does not necessarily mean that that uh, sets us up for a sharp uh, rate of uh, increase. Uh, in listening to the comments that we've heard thus far, um, I, I, I would um, sort of step back and characterize uh, the world from a rather simplistic uh, two-engine uh, uh, perspective. Uh, on the demand side is the, um, uh, the what I think is going to be a, a major headwinds for years to come from the biggest consumer in the world, the American consumer, uh, who um, went into this crisis blind, uh, overextended, uh, saving short, dependent on two bubbles which have um, uh, unfortunately now burst of uh, property and uh, credit. The American consumer spent, uh, as a drunken sailor did for 12 years, growing spending at close to 4% a year for 12 years. Over the next three to five years, uh, that 4% uh, trend is going to be uh, probably less than two. Uh, and there's no other consumer that is going to take the American consumer's place. China has a lot of people but they're savers, they're not consumers. Uh, the U.S. consumed $10 trillion last year. The Chinese uh, consumption was closer to one and a quarter uh, trillion dollars. So look for significant uh, headwinds on the demand side. On the supply side of the world, there's no force that's more powerful than, than China. Uh, and um, uh, we've learned a long time ago in economics that uh, open-ended supply in the face of headwinds on the demand front, uh, that's problematic, uh, and China does not get dispensation from one of the most basic rules of economics. Uh, China's done a masterful job in responding to the crisis, uh, and I give China tremendous credit for doing that. The question to address in listening to my good friend uh, Ju Min um, uh, in, in talking about 8% growth is, what do you end up emphasizing in China? the quantity of growth or the quality of growth. Critical distinction that China must address right now, especially in the context of Premier Wen Jiabao's own diagnosis of China two and a half years ago at the end of the National People's Congress when he warned of a China that was increasingly unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and ultimately unsustainable. His words, not mine. And yet the numbers uh, in the first half of this year are problematic in one key respect for China. 7.1% GDP growth on average, terrific, but 88% of that was concentrated in sector, fixed asset investment. Uh, there's never been an investment-led impetus, even in China, of the degree that we saw in the first half of this year, and it was funded by 7 trillion RMB in bank lending, the biggest surge in bank loans uh, in um, uh, uh, modern China's history. So there are problems on the demand side. There are still imbalances on the supply side. And this leads me to my conclusion on the global economy. Um, the recovery, while the markets are pricing for a vigorous recovery, I think is likely to uh, uh, be fragile and anemic. And policymakers uh, are likely to remain pre predisposed toward accommodation in that climate. I take um, Takanaka-san's uh, point very, very seriously. When you go through a crisis like this uh, and you, you're left with a, in a post-bubble world, the aftershocks will linger. Uh, and it's important uh, to, to keep that in mind. And I would just conclude, Martin, with turning your first point uh, back to you. you. You said very correctly and very dramatically, never before has there been a policy a stimulus, the likes of which we've seen uh, in the past year. Absolutely right. But then the corollary of that, Martin, and this is a question to you, um, it follows that there has never before ever been a withdrawal of that stimulus on the scale that we will have to see once recovery uh, then begins to take place. How do we pull that off without dis uh, disrupting uh, what is an increasingly fragile post-crisis, post-bubble world? Uh, and, and I, I know you're a moderator, and I know you think about these things a lot, and we'd love to hear <laughs> your thoughts on that one. 
You can't break the rules of the World Economic Forum so easily, you know. <laughs> I'm definitely the moderator. Uh, I will actually come to this in a moment because, interestingly, that was precisely the follow-up question I was going to ask you. Uh, <laughs> We have worked and together I, let for me, too long. And we'll come back to this, because I think others will have to comment on this. Uh, you have described, and I think that's implicit really in what everybody has been saying here, a world which has, to a significant degree, structural excess capacity, uh, structural excess supply, um, uh, with a pretty weak final consumption engine. China has resolved this problem in the traditional way in the short run with a stupendous burst of investment, which must by definition, at least in some cases, add to capacity. And I agree with you completely that it's very difficult to see Western consumption exploding upwards. So we rely on this immense um, monetary stimulus. They're basically giving money away free as Japan has been doing for decades, well, well over a decade, without much visible sign of success, and the fiscal policy. Now, the Japanese experience would suggest exit doesn't happen. You're just stuck with this. <laughs> and, no, 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 no. And, and the, um, if I remember correctly, the figures may be slightly wrong, to, uh, I apologize, Takanaka-san. Um, the, the gross public debt ratio in Japan is now 200%. But the interest rates are 1.3%. That would suggest that the, there isn't going to be an exit. People will just go on buying public bonds and accepting free money and nothing happens. The alternative view out there, very strongly expressed, particularly in the United States, is there's going to be a monetary panic. There's going to be massive inflation there's going to be a flight from the dollar, there's going to be a flight for dollar bonds, and Armageddon is in store. Both of these can't be true. But it clearly is plausible one or other could be true. And then the third is a nice smooth exit. I'd I'm happy to come back and have my own views, but I, perhaps I could start with you, Takanaga-san. Which of these views do you have about at least the medium term danger of handling the government stimulus programs? Are we facing more of a, a prolonged period of very weak, money, loose monetary policy and huge fiscal deficits, or are we perhaps facing a real risk of a flight from above all, uh, and most significantly, the dollar, where fiscal deficits are massive and public debt ratios are exploding? Which is the real danger and what are the mistakes we could make here? Because I think that clearly frightens people very much around the world. What is your perspective? Okay, I basically agree that it is quite difficult to find out the exit. But this is not impossible. This is possible. Actually, very honestly speaking, in my understanding, Koizumi, Prime Minister Koizumi, almost done that. Uh, the, the basic way is so to recover the primary balance of the budget and when the Koizumi government started, the primary uh, deficit uh, to GDP ratio was so 5%. This declined to 2% already, but all of a sudden, uh, Prime Minister Aso uh, took a reverse policy. So if strong political leadership continues, it is possible. One important experience in that process is it is quite important to realize the appropriate nominal growth rate. Nominal economic growth rate is very important. Of course, real growth is very important. At the same time, for example, government revenue is dependent on nominal GDP. And bank business is influenced very much by nominal GDP growth. So conquering deflation, the role of bank, uh, central bank is very important. And of course, it is important to taking the deregulation, privatization, and around the investment, a real GDP should be increased. Uh, but nominal GDP management is another important aspect to conquer that. Anyway, primary balance should be realized. It, is, it could be done, but it is very difficult to realize that. It would take seven years or so, and it is very easy to take a reverse policy. The implication of what you say, let me make sure that I understand this, yep. in relevance to where we are now, then I'll come to the other economists, is, are you saying basically the Bank of Japan failed? And 
Do you, if so, fail to avoid deflation, which after all was the job of the central bank is to, to, to have price stability. Is the Fed avoiding that mistake in your view or making it? Well, in my view, Bank of Japan failed. Yes, I believe, I still believe that. Uh, because they have been avoiding to set the inflation target. If inflation target was employed by the Bank of Japan, the result, result was a little bit different. Of course, also it's understandable from the viewpoint of central bank, it is not easy to conquer deflation. Still, controlling money supply, they can do that. And in some countries, they have been doing good monetary policy. The monetary policy role is very important. And the Fed? And is, what? Is Mr. Bernanke avoiding that mistake? Well, Bernanke has been long been the advocate of inflation targeting. I hope he will have this kind of explicit policy for inflation targeting. So by purchasing assets from the market, they can control the money supply. And uh, through this money supply, they can control, to some extent, the level, the inflation rate. So it's understandable. Money multiplier is declining under such confidence. Uh, confidence uh, crisis, but still, there's still room for central bank do, to do. It is very important. We have been discussing for over in the past year or so fiscal policy, only fiscal policy, but the whole monetary policy should be readdressed again. If I may return to you, and I will answer your question at some point, Stephen. Okay. Um, uh, you wrote a rather wonderful piece for our paper in which you said that Mr. Bernanke should have been sacked. Um, and the implication now, he is of course, as we all know, uh, the doyen of inflation targeters. <laughs> and uh, Takanaka-san commended him for this and suggested that he's doing a rather better job than the Bank of Japan. But you obviously think he's failing completely. So what should they be doing to manage the monetary side of this incredibly difficult exit? Would you recommend they should be tightening monetary policy? Should they stop QE? What sh Given where they are now, leave aside this incredible mess which we agree they inherit, that he was partly responsible and he inherited when he became governor, a chairman of the Fed. What should they be doing now to manage this exit process? First of all, Martin, I, I did not recommend he be sacked. I recommended that he not be reappointed. I, uh, <laughs> and just, I just accept the defense. distinction, though I would argue it, that it, there isn't much difference since he's not got more than a few months to go. Okay. Um, and just to be absolutely clear, the reason that I, I came to that conclusion was while he has done um, a pretty good job in the last, uh, I'd say, 11 and a half months uh, since uh, the, the crisis uh, really um, hit its maximum. I, I don't think he did a, a good job in, in the years before that in condoning uh, a lot of excesses that his um, uh, predecessor uh, put in place uh, in uh, allowing the U.S. economy to become a bubble-dependent nation, uh, and in failing to uh, enforce the Fed's uh, regulatory and supervisory responsibilities. And I'm hugely critical of Mr. Bernanke's so-called global savings glut thesis, which makes it sound as if China was responsible as America's creditor uh, for the excesses uh, of uh, leverage that Wall Street indulged in and that American consumers indulged in. China had nothing to do with that, and that, that turns the, um, uh, the argument inside out and, and fails to um, hold Americans accountable for their own reckless actions. I think, Mr. Bernanke, in answer to your question, though, needs to be uh, crystal clear and transparent in laying out what an exit strategy is, uh, specifically in terms of the withdrawal of the um, uh, the very special uh, series of um, uh, liquidity injections that have been put in place. There are 12 of them right now uh, in the United States. How long will they last? What is the time frame of withdrawal under several uh, 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 recovery uh, scenarios? I think he has to be transparent also in terms of what it would take to normalize interest rates, what the normal interest rate would look like. This was the main problem 
of Alan Greenspan. He took uh, the federal funds rate down to 1% and held it there for far too long, sowed the seeds for future bubbles, and then embraced a very incremental uh, uh, exit strategy in trying to normalize uh, the funds rate that actually continued to fuel uh, the credit and property bubbles uh, of uh, more uh, recent years. So uh, we, we have a Herculean task ahead of us, and the only way uh, I think to be credible um, is, is to identify exactly the time frame and the orders of magnitude of what the appropriate exit strategy would be and to put that out for the markets to examine and scrutinize and give him feedback on. Xu Min, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think this is absolutely uh, important issues. It seemed to me the world economy goes through an L-shape uh, sort of path. We just stopped from cliff drop so far. We haven't seen any size of recovery yet. We're still in the very low level, you know. I think 10, 10 months ago, I talked about the global economy go to the L shape and Chinese uh, economy go to the V shape, you know. The media calls LV theory. I guess that means uh, Louis Vuitton. <laughs> but that's exactly today. I think it's uh, this L. Now, the problem is the whole market committed, the government committed $9 trillion for the liquidity. That's number one. The U.S. government committed $4 trillion for the fiscal the deficits to rescue the whole thing. Now, we are stopping here already. I expect to see we'll stay at that level for quite a long time. You know, I, I really don't see the world will go a strong rebound like a V and, uh, in the near futures. Yes, we saw uh, the U.S. and some Japan, South Korea have a positive growth in the, in the last month. But you've got to be very careful. It's just a month-to-month -month growth rate. If you're looking for the annualized year-to-year -year growth rate, United States is still negative 5.2%, and Japan even worse. That's a 10.1%, so the South Korea more or the same thing. So we're staying in that level. It's not a strong, it's just a little rebound from the very drop, uh, much drop, but we're staying there. At that point, I also agree with you. It's a very important still say to have a clear message to the world what will be the access strategy. I would say it's too early to talk about access today because the world still needs a fiscal and a monetary policy to stabilize the current of very low economy because the whole thing is very fragile. But given $9 trillion liquidity in the market, given $4 trillion U.S. debt, the people obviously concerns inflation pressure, people obviously concerns U.S. deficits, people obviously concerns about the dollar on devaluation size. So a clear message from particularly U.S. Fed, I think it's absolutely important to tell the world what's the goal, whether it's a pre-cycle will create another bubble as a few U.S. Fed chairman did before. I don't want to mention the name. But or, or the Fed have a clear target, this time counter-cycle, like Paul Volcker did 18 years ago, and really have a tough policy, but makes him go through the whole thing. I think this is absolutely important, and the world is looking for uh, from Washington. Does either you, Anthony, or your Excellency want to comment very briefly so I can have time for questions, please? Uh, Anthony? I, I, in general, agree with what uh, Zhu Ming has said. But on the other hand, uh, having been a financial official before and just kind of speculating what may happen rather than what should happen, um, it is in general to um, the government, particularly if, if it is a so-called popularly elected government, for them to uh, adopt an easier monetary policy than uh, tightening uh, or a tight monetary policy. Because particularly now that uh, we are all saying that uh, while the, um, the credit market is stabilized and uh, maybe the stock market is rebounding, but we are not seeing any real rebound in the real economy. Um, and also, uh, in the West, we have a, uh, still a financial sector that needs to be recapitalized. Then it would be actually to the government's advantage to have some inflation, because with inflation and keeping a certain interest margin between the lending rate and the deposit rate, you're recapitalizing the bank. And that was how the US recapitalized the bank in the 1990s, in the early 1990s. Also, the, um, 
with inflation, you will keep the people that have assets happy. For those people that have, that have low assets, they will be unhappy, but the government can use other means, such as transfer payment, to make them happier. So the tendency is for uh, governments to allow the monetary policy to be easier so that you have inflation. And also it is politically much more difficult to so-called withdraw this liquidity from the market. That's why while it would be nice uh, to have a so-called exit strategy with clear timetables and indicators, my fear is because of the political pressure, um, it may not happen. And also as a financial official who has one of the very few in the world that has managed through deflation, deflation is much more difficult to tackle than inflation. Do you want to add anything very, very briefly, please? Um, just, uh, I think, just to pick up on what has been said, I mean, the, we've, the question is, we need to move from the policies that help to policies that solve. And, and if we're at the bottom of the L, um, this, one thing this crisis has shown us is that the, the fundamental laws of gravity and the fundamental laws of economics still apply. And I think what Stephen said is, we still have to work out and get a balance of supply and demand. So it will take time for this to be uh, solved. I don't think we will go back. I mean, there'll be pockets of exceptions, but on a global scale, we still have to work out uh, all I, the excesses. Let me go to the questions. I'm going to uh, take some questions now. I'm sorry we well, not really sorry, because I think this has been a fascinating conversation. We'll have opportunities later. Um, anybody wants to ask a question? Question, please. Very short. I'll take a few together. Say who you are, and uh, um, we'll go from there. Uh, the, uh, lady at the back there, in the sort of middle. Yes, you. I'm, Len, I'm from uh, Hershing.com. I have uh, two questions. The first one is to Mr. Zhu Ming. Uh, just now in your speech, you mentioned that the macro economy is still actually in, a, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, a deflation, but asset price is actually uh, uh, like uh, inflation. Now, as an economist, economist, how shall we balance our monetary policy in the future, uh, but, but balancing uh, deflation and inflation? And how shall we use uh, the um, interest rate policies? Um, and the second question is to Mr. Anthony Leung. Last year, in the uh, Tianjin Davos Econ World Economic Forum, you mentioned that um, this is actually a very good timing for Chinese companies to go out and merge and acquire other companies. How would you comment on um, this particular topic now? And also, how should Chinese companies choose um, and use this opportunity? OK, I'll add a few more questions. Uh, other people who want to ask questions? A gentleman here. Um, could you stand up, please? Yes. First question is, uh, so far the world's major stock markets have achieved a substantial rise. According to the performance of stock markets, can we say that the world economy has turned around? Second, uh, uh, the last round of international uh, financial market uh, fluctuation is from the private sector with the September 15th coming. The confidence in U the United States Treasury bonds and the dollar exchange rate is being tested. Will there be a new round of fl fluctuation from the U.S. national credit crisis in the fourth uh, quarter? Thank you. Okay, another question. Somebody at the back. Yes, yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. And this is a, um, I'm Charles Gethler. I uh, we produce conferences called The Money Show. Um, this is really going back to what uh, Martin, you, and, and Stephen Roach were talking about earlier. Um, Irving Fisher basically described this, the very circumstance that we're in economically uh, today, um, and Lacey Hunt, Gary Schilling, a number of others who actually predicted uh, Can you get we were going into please this. Please get to the question. Yeah, the question is, uh, are you prepared... Uh, uh, Stephen, basically to say that we are going to muddle through, that we aren't going into a debt deflation, uh, as Irving uh, Fisher had uh, described. I'll take one more question now. Uh, the lady in the middle there. Yes, you, please. 
Uh, you'll, there should be a microphone for you. We're not going to get to all the questions. I apologize. There's nothing we can do. Reporter from NetEase, I have questions for Zhu Ming and Stephen Roach. Uh, Mr. Wen, um, uh, Premier Wen Jiabao said yesterday that 8% GDP growth can be uh, reached this year. So what's your forecast for uh, China's economic growth next year and for the uh, global economy? Thanks. OK. Um, I'll take these questions. Um, I'll start with you, Zhu Min, on uh, the question on forecast for China's growth uh, next year and uh, and the year and the world. Zhu Min? I think there's a job for Steve, though. Uh, Steve oh. always do the best of forecasting every year. <laughs> <laughs> I would say uh, China probably will be to maintain uh, roughly around 8 or a little bit more than 8% of GDP growth rates for next year. Uh, I'm pretty confident for that because uh, uh, the current uh, uh, the, the infrastructure spending still moving on. So a lot of uh, greenfield projects still going on. And we see uh, exports are very much stabilized and we're regaining market shares in Latin American area, Middle East, and in the, the, the Asia. And also regaining in the American market. The European market is not there yet, but it's quite well. Consumption also very strong. It will be stronger. So and I would say next year we have more confidence they have more than 8% GDP growth rates than this year uh, we had. For global economy, I'm not that particularly optimistic. I think uh, the global is still struggling. Uh, if we will be able to reach 1.5% uh, to 2% of GDP growth rates, that will be great news for everyone. But for global issues, there are very important conditions for monetary policy. Uh, I agree with, with you, Martin. If you talk about the fiscal policy and the monetary policy today, I would say the fiscal monetary policy is still the key policy issues for the future, particularly for the next, next few years uh, for the world. The key issues, the current uh, direction for the global monetary uh, policy is still not all clear yet. If we don't have a clear access strategy, not necessarily being the timetable, but the direction for the approach, we probably will run into another bubble and inflationary situations, as Steve mentioned, so someone can commentary on so that. In that sense, we may have more than 2% of GDP growth rates, but that's a very bad number. And uh, I uh, personally, I don't want to see that happen. I'd rather have a low uh, GDP growth rates, but solid uh, economic recover. I think that would be better things uh, for everyone uh, in this room and in this world. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to, I'm not going to ask all of you all the questions because of lack of time. Stephen, I'm just going to ask you a couple. Uh, first, if you have a, want to add anything on the forecast, you may, but perhaps you'd comment on um, uh, two questions. Is there a risk, a serious risk of Fisher style debt deflation in the US? Um, and second, I know this is a subject for a thesis, how should central banks balance asset prices and goods and services prices when they're giving such directly opposite signals as they are now, since you're very critical of the inflation targeting of uh, Greenspan, um, what should they be doing? So could you respond to those two questions? Yes. Uh, on, on the first one, Martin, uh, I, I'm not going to give the green light on the, the, the U.S. or the global economy. There is no quick fix after the, uh, the crisis and deep recession that we went through. Uh, there, there's going to be some vigorous growth for a quarter or two because of an inventory dynamic, but limited follow through on the demand front. The US economy, I think, on, on the demand front will still be growing anemically, very close to its stall speed, uh, and vulnerable to a potential relapse uh, that um, you and the journalistic profession uh, write about um, in, the, in the context of the so-called dreaded double dip. Uh, when you have a, an economy growing at a stall speed, you are vulnerable to a relapse um, uh, with just the slightest of shocks. And so um, uh, to the extent that you do get a relapse, the, the Fisher debt deflation uh, scenario is one that cannot be ruled out. Central banks, um, they can't be trusted. I think that's the lesson uh, of the last um, uh, 12 years. Uh, don't believe what they tell you. Uh, and you must therefore change their mandates and you must require them 
to focus not just on price stability, not just on full employment, as is the case in the United States, but also on financial stability. Uh, and they must be held accountable for adhering to targets of, um, on, on, on all three fronts so that when we have obvious asset build, uh, bubbles building, as we did in equities in the late 90s, as we did in <coughs> credit and housing more recently, they must therefore uh, run tighter policies than otherwise might be the case. As Bill White, formerly of the BIS, uh, put it very eloquently, uh, they must use something that's rare in central banking circles, uh, two words called common sense. I'm going to actually turn that to you, uh, Takanaka-san, on this monetary policy. My reaction is to ask central banks with one instrument effectively to hit three targets, financial stability, asset market stability, price and goods, price of goods and services stability is just asking for the impossible. And if you ask officials to for the impossible, they will fail. Um, so, in other words, I don't agree. What You've is done your a terrific view? job so far? Too. Yes, they are, they have duly failed. So, um, what is your reaction to that issue about how they should handle these very divergent signals they're getting at the moment? Well, first of all, ba uh, central bank should forget about asset price. They should focus uh, the real level of price to avoid the real debt. This is very important. The imp the, some economists are now worrying about inflation, but I'm really afraid about deflation. This is our experience, actually. Now, the, the balance sheet of central bank is expanding. The central bank, uh, Fed balance sheet became more than double in the, the past year. After that, they are very nervous about to, to, uh, you know, uh, shrinking. They, they focus to shrink this balance sheet. Under that process, deflation occurred. I'm really afraid of that deflation. We've got, we're really running out of time, so let, may I ask a couple of questions I'll put to Anthony? Uh, you can deal with these. The stock market has risen, uh, therefore the recession is over, because the stock market cannot be wrong, can it? And, uh, um, but there was another question, which is, should we expect a credit market crisis in the dollar, dollar credits in the next quarter? Uh, which would imply maybe the stock market could be wrong. What is your view actually looking at the markets of what they're telling us, if anything? Well, the conventional wisdom is that the equity market will lead the real economy by about six to nine months. That may well be the case, but on the other hand, that we are seeing that the amount of money versus the size of the real economy, the multiple is increasing. So while uh, the equity market may be kind of foretelling that the real economy may rebound, uh, I don't think it's going to be in exactly the same shape. Secondly, uh, because of the amount of money, or should I say the multiple of money to real economy is, in, is, is larger than before, uh, all we can say is that there'll be more volatility. Do you want to do anything on the equity markets? Um, Jumin, since we're in China, uh, and I've got to the end. Um, I'm going to give you, apart from me, the last word on what you've heard. Um, because essentially what I'm getting from this is very much a re-decoupling story. China's going to be fine, whatever. Uh, perhaps the rest of Asia. And basically uh, the rest of the world, and particularly the US, uh, Europe. We haven't even talked about Europe, which is fascinating just not really interesting or in a terrible mess. Is that, is that your perception? Is that the, the message people should go away with? Uh, uh, basically, no, but some degree of yes. And thank you, Martin. You're so kind of giving me another 200 minutes, minutes to talk. Um, you might be a lonely part of that, 200 know, minutes. Have, have <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, I would say, uh, currently, you see on the, on the world, it's a very two different world. China and particularly some Asian countries are doing very well, uh, but I don't think it's uh, decoupling because globally, China is still very much dependent on the global demand. And also, China will be able to maintain a certain period in the next few years by the infrastructure and the government stimulus package. But overall, we are still living in the global community, I think this is a big issue. If you believe in the decoupling as a discussion with Steve Roach, you have to agree with deglobalization, which is obviously not an issue we want to see and obviously not an issue currently 
is going on. Martin, can I ask you a question, a final question, please? You, how many books have you written on globalization? Uh, too yeah. many, probably. Well, they've, they've been terrific books. And the question I have for you is, can you believe in globalization and decoupling uh, in that globalization is built on cross-border linkages which seem to be growing exponentially in recent years? Okay, there are two questions for me. This is completely breaks all the rules. So um, my answer to that one is, uh, it comes down to the question of whether countries have macroeconomic policy autonomy. One of the interesting indications of this crisis the last year is how much autonomy some emerging market countries have had. And this links with this big subject. The main reason they have so much autonomy is they've insured themselves so effectively. And they've insured themselves by accumulating vast quantities of reserves as a deliberate policy. And where I disagree with you, Stephen, is that I do think very much that's part of the reason why we have this massive financial crisis. So one of the most interesting and fascinating features of the world system in the last 10 years is that the very policies which were completely and rationally taken to ensure a de substantial degree of policy autonomy actually created systemic problems. And that is why reform of the whole international system, in my view, is incredibly important. The second question you asked me is the exit. Um, and I thought our discussion of the exit was fascinating, as was our discussion of monetary policy, because it revealed the fact that economists don't agree on anything, uh, not least the time of day. And the, the fundamental point is, do we, looking at it now, do we think we are facing a very serious global deflationary threat or a very serious inflation threat. Um, personally, as I have said in my column this week, I regard the inflation scare of the moment as complete hysteria. I see nothing in the system now that can generate serious global inflation except an irrational panic. And the thing that we have seen in the last year is how much damage an irrational panic would do. And the form the rational panic would take, of course, will be a global flight from dollar assets. And that links to the exit strategy question. Whatever exit strategy the Americans take, and clearly the US dollar is far and away the most important currency in the world, it has to be one that convinces the holders of wealth who are very nervous by their nature that the US is not interested in the inflation strategy, the, 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 the debauching the currency strategy, which Anthony mentioned. And that's a psychological problem. It's not a technical problem. And it's not clear that there is anything in the American political system that allows them to solve this problem. So there's no rational reason for inflation, which doesn't mean that the panic couldn't create tremendous problems. The conclusion I will make from this from this uh, fascinating discussion is that it is not without reason that economics is called the dismal science. It's an old description, uh, goes back, if I remember correctly, to Carlyle. But the basic point is we have a recovery, we have a financial uh, recovery, the panic is over, but there's a lot of worry expressed in this panel about what's going to happen in the developed world in particular over the next year or two and the sustainability and vigor of the recovery, and a lot of worry about how the exit will be managed. And the crucial point is that a whole host of huge structural problems, overhangs of debt, inadequate savings, massive fiscal deficits and exploding debt remain unresolved. And until they are, we can't have a healthy global recovery. So uh, my advice to the business people in this room is expect excitement. <laughs> and with that, may I thank the panelists for their wonderful discussion. Thank you.